again, ladies and gentlemen, for another foray into the political realm, if you will. And, and we've got a good topic today, man. We've got a doozy. We've got one of these topics that just seems to be one of those things that gets under my skin. It, it, it gets my, as my grandfather would say, it gets my dandruff up. Uh, it, as Peter Griffin would say, it really grinds my gears. Today we're going to talk about the left's particular brand of racism. Now, some of you, no doubt, are hearing me say that and seeing the title of this presentation, and you're wondering, what, racism on the left? There is no such thing. The left, the left are, are, are not racist at all. There, there's no racial discord there among the left whatsoever. In fact, the, the left, are, the American left, are the people that, that, that help all the minorities against you evil conservatives who are all racist. Well, not so much. Um, it is true that the American left has positioned themselves for the last 40 to 50 years as the sole guardians of racial sensitivity. Uh, that they feel they are those who are the only ones qualified to tell the rest of us how we should behave and act and think in terms of race. They believe it is their job to police the language that everybody uses and make sure that we don't say anything that might be considered insensitive here or there, or use words that we shouldn't use, or determine what words we can use or can't, or uh, in, in any number of ways what we can or can't do that might possibly upset somebody somewhere. Uh, they place sensitivity above everything else, it seems like. And they've done this for about a half century, but it really ramped up to a tremendous degree during the 2008 presidential campaign, the campaign of Barack Obama, when anybody who dared criticize Obama whatsoever on policy or anything else was accused of racial insensitivity or outright racism. Now, no question there were a few knuckleheads out there who, you know, brought a couple of signs out to some rallies that they probably shouldn't have. Uh, but certainly that didn't speak for the majority of Americans who have a real issue with Barack Obama and what he stands for. But don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. The left really continued to perpetrate that myth and uh, put that racial insensitivity bug out there. So there are countless examples, many of them recent, on, on how the American left uh, tries to castigate those on the right for anything we say or do regarding race. It's, it's almost as if their intention or their, their entire attitude is the, the right cannot say anything at all regarding race, cannot make any sort of suggestions for what can be done about problems within the minority communities of America. You guys just need to sit back there and, and let the left do all the talking on this. Really. Well, we had a little issue come up within the last couple of weeks that, if you look at it, really turns the left's guardianship of racial issues onto its ear. Uh, a situation that has been covered a little bit on Sean Hannity's show and, and uh, Dana Lash, who's a local personality here, who is just a step away from becoming a great national star, they cover this topic a little bit, and I want to touch on it as well. It's something you may have heard about, you may not have. If you haven't, I'm going to bring you up to speed on what's happened here. A couple of weeks ago, a lot of you will remember that the CPAC convention, the Conservative Political Action Committee, they had their convention going on, and uh, as is the case with most conventions of any type, be it a political convention, a convention of accountants, a convention of any type of, of group of people, uh, there is a tendency to have a, just an, an endless line and an endless parade of speeches going across the dais. Uh, anybody who's anybody who wants to have 20 minutes to say their piece is allowed to do so. And as with most conventions, some of the speeches are really good, some of the speeches end up being the cure for insomnia, a lot of the speeches end up being somewhere in between. Well, among these speeches, was a talk given by a gentleman named Herman Cain. Now, some of you might not be terribly familiar with Herman Cain. I particularly didn't know a lot about him. I'd heard the name, but I didn't know a lot about him before this entire kerfuffle happened. Uh, I a little, know a little bit more about him now than I did before. Uh, but Herman Cain is a gentleman who is a newspaper columnist, syndicated newspaper columnist. He also hosts a radio talk show out of Atlanta. Uh, he was also the chief executive officer for Godfather's Pizza for a period of time. Was also over the uh, federal bank in Kansas City. So he's got a pretty impressive uh, resume in that regard. Uh, Mr. Kane is also a dedicated conservative. And he has made some noise and formed some exploratory committees and, and started the process 
of running for the presidency in 2012. Now, whether he'll be a, a candidate who has very much of a chance or a serious candidate or whatever, all of that is up in the air. It's too early to say. But nevertheless, he has some designs on uh, making that run and running that race. He also happens to be an African American. Now, uh, when I viewed Kane's speech and, and I saw it, I, I thought it was pretty interesting. He talked about, you know, how a lot of the, the issues with America today are, are, you know, pent up in what he calls the three Asians. It's because of too much legislation, too much regulation, and too much taxation. Those being three of the things that have caused a lot of the problems we're seeing right now. I agree with him on that. I thought he, I thought he put that in a very, uh, very well phrased way. A very catchy way, and he really hit the nail on the head with that. And, you know, I, I agree with what he says, but in, in, in all, it's not really anything that you would see out of the ordinary at a CPAC convention, that kind of speech. That's not any terribly different than what most other CPAC uh, speakers would say. So, uh, you know, maybe nothing to see there, but I thought it was, it, it was well put. Uh, however, Kane's speech got quite a bit of vitriol and quite a vitriolic reaction from a pundit over at a site called alternet.org. Now this is a left-wing site where if you go there you'll see all kinds of articles and posts on various left-wing topics. Uh, they have their place in the liberal blogosphere. And there was a person there named uh, Chauncey De Vega. That's a, as I understand it, that's a uh, pen name or a pseudonym. It's not the guy's real name, but uh, Mr. Chauncey De Vega, whoever you are, uh, had a very scathing review of Kane's speech, and, and that really is what this whole kerfuffle is all about. But the interesting thing about Chauncey De Vega's reaction was not that it took any particular issue with the points of Herman Kane's speech. It really didn't. It, it didn't even touch on what the substance of Kane's speech was. He didn't talk about uh, Kane's viewpoint on the over-legislation, the over-regulation, the over-taxation in our nation. And truth be told, if you read De Vega's piece, he barely mentioned Kane's speech at all. But what De Vega took issue with was some of the mannerisms that, that Kane came out with and, and some of his performance, if you will. And rather than interpreting De Vega's words for you, let me just read to you De Vega's actual words from his piece. And kind of gauge your own reaction to it. Uh, Chauncey De Vega stated in his reaction to Herman Cain's speech, As you know, I find black garbage pail kids, which he then crossed out, as you can do on an internet posting, you still see the phrase, As you know, I find black garbage pail kids, which he crossed out and then put black conservatives, fascinating. Not because of what they believe, but because of how they entertain their white conservative masters. Wow. Now, um, you know, I, I, I've seen a lot of uh, speech that's been criticized in my time for racial insensitivity. Um, some of which was justified, some of which not. Brother, that one ranks right up there. But this DeVega character wasn't through yet. He goes on to say later in his, his little piece, We always need a monkey in the window, for he or she reminds us of our humanity while simultaneously reinforcing a sense of our own superiority. Sadly, these are always folks who are willing to play the role because it pays so well. Go for the jugular, why don't you there, Mr. DeVega? Tell us how you really feel. Wow. So, DeVega completely ignores the substance of what Kane says. That's not a real shocker when it comes to left-wing pundits. But he uses some language there that I think anybody would say is, man, that, that crossed the line. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and spend 10 or 20 minutes going off on the language this guy chose to use. It's offensive by anybody's, uh, anybody's definition, but at the same time, I, I've always believed that 
when we get into topics of racial sensitivity, I, I think we focus so much on the language people use and what they're allowed and not allowed to say that it really, it, it really keeps us from actually discussing the problems that are out there. And I think that's a, a tactic from the left that they employ purposely. Uh, so we could easily get into a discussion of Chauncey de Vega said some racially insensitive things and someone on the left could come back and say, well, this conservative over here said some racially insensitive things. And you go back and forth in a pissing match for you know, a week or so and everybody pulling out quotes from everybody else. But in truth, as offensive as the language was that de Vega used, there's something to me that's much more troubling than that. There's something I see in this that's much more offensive to me than the mere language that de Vega used. And, and it's something that I would suspect would be offensive to a lot of other African Americans and other, quote, disadvantaged people. The truly offensive thing that DeVega did here and that he exhibited was his attitude towards African Americans. He basically came right out and said that he cannot think or he cannot understand or he cannot conceptualize why an African American could possibly identify with the conservative movement. And he could only insinuate could only insinuate that the only reason that any of them do so is strictly because they're getting paid. <coughs> that it pays well to do so. Evidently, you can't think of another reason to do so. Later on through the week, uh, De Vega posted kind of a retort. Didn't back down off his statements any, but he, he tried to clarify it in some way, basically saying that what he criticizes within the black conservative community is that in his mind, they're not showing the love, that they are not uh, identifying or making a connection with uh, the ills of the past. Well, you know, Mr. DeVega, I have to, I hate to break it to you, but you can understand history, appreciate history, be knowledgeable of history, learn from history, without obsessing over it to the point that you believe the issues of 150 years ago are some sort of bogeyman, or bogeyman that uh, describes and that has a direct correlation with what your life today is. Sorry, the history of history is history, the past is the past. Some of us don't obsess over it. Some African Americans don't obsess over it. But what DeVega does throughout both of his rants there is he, he really encapsulates the attitude among a lot of the leftists. Now most of them won't come out and use the language that DeVega used. Uh, they won't go that far, but there is a, a sense among the American left that African Americans are somehow being disloyal if they leave liberalism and go to the uh, conservative movement. And beyond even the racial aspect of it, the American left seems to have a similar attitude with anybody who they consider to be in a disadvantaged group who dares to align with conservatism. 